uh, in uh, get uh, coming on this show today. I, I would like to uh, talk about again uh, one important and international faculty, Dr. Siva, uh, who is uh, very famously called as Siva, and his name is Dr. Ahilan Siva Ganeshan, who is working as an associate professor at the uh, Thomas Jefferson Institute in Philadelphia, and he is doing extensively spine practice. Welcome you on board, Dr. Siva. Uh, I would like to uh, again thank uh, Dr. Suresh Pillai, who is one of the senior faculties in uh, South India. He is practicing at Baby Memorial Hospital, uh, Calicut, and uh, we, we all have seen uh, Dr. Suresh's extensive work in various fields, especially osteoporosis, and that will be a great additional benefit for all of us. Uh, again, I would like to uh, in, uh, thank Dr. Arun Bhanot, who is an imminent spine surgeon in New Delhi. Uh, he is practicing at Manipal Hospital and he is known for his endoscopic and minimally invasive work. And we are thankful, Arun, for uh, coming on this show today. Thank you. Uh, and we have, again, one very imminent and MIS osteoporosis, deformity, and endoscopic surgeon, Dr. Varun Agarwal from Bareilly, uh, Rohilakhand Medical College. Uh, and Varun is doing a lot of advanced work and uh, we are seeing his work in various platforms. Uh, we really would like to thank uh, Varun uh, for your enthusiasm and uh, being there on the show today. We have uh, two uh, associate uh, spine surgeons, Dr. Bhushan Patil, uh, who is uh, working with us at Sancheti Hospital, Pune. Uh, and Dr. Nishad Situt, who is uh, also associate spine surgeon working with us, uh, will be also enlightening us on some small topics uh, in osteoporosis. But yes, uh, we would like to continue this program. Uh, it will be a case-based discussion. Uh, only uh, uh, important things which are uh, for routine practice, which we all are uh, dealing with, and let's see what conclusion we can take. I'm sure there will be a lot of take home messages today. Thank you. And I would like to definitely thank the most important Ortho TV for giving us this platform, which is going all across the globe. Uh, Dr. Ashok Sham and Dr. Neeraj Bilani for this wonderful uh, li uh, license with uh, Association of Spine Surgeons of India. I hand over uh, the mic to Dr. Saumijit Basu, the president ASSI. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sailesh, and uh, it's my real privilege and honor to speak <laughs> a few words in this August gathering. Firstly, after I took over, I was very sure that the advocacy committee, which has been uh, typically headed by Dr. Chhabra and his broad shoulders have carried the entire work of advocacy over the last few years from the ASSI perspective, and he heads the chair he heads the Committee on Advocacy of ASSI, and he has been joined very ably by Dr. Sahidesh Hargaonkar. I'm grateful to both of you for arranging this very relevant program on a very auspicious day, which happens to be the World Osteoporosis Day. As we are all aware that osteoporosis is the major burden of disease across the country, and with our growing population of elderly people, we are going to see a lot more of these problems in our daily clinical practice. And the good news is that over the last couple of decades, we've gone a long way in enhancing the medical treatment of this disease, as well as surgical aspects have really grown up. And over the last couple of decades, we have really seen big advances in the surgical management of these patients. So we now have solutions to a lot of problems which we did not have in the past. And I'm sure there are many products in the pipeline, as well as many molecules in the pipeline, which is good. Again, I thank all of you to, uh, from the core of my heart, because this program is going to be a great success, I can assure you. Um, and handing over the mic to the next speaker with again a word of thanks to all the faculty who've joined and my special thanks to Dr. Harvinder Singh Chabra and Dr. Sailesh Argao. 
thank you thank you basu sir for uh, your kind words and great support for this uh, academic initiative on world osteoporosis day i just would like to start with a case let's uh, head to a case and see what uh, we all feel about this this is a 72 year old lady dorsal <laughs> pain mid back pain no leg pain she had a fall one month back and persistent pain not uh, getting better with medications and this is what is the x ray i would like to ask chabra sir how you will treat this patient um so shalesh uh, if i got you properly this uh, was an injury one month back and uh, the patient has severe pain which has not responded to treatment right yes but her back pain was more than a month but that fall precipitated her pain um fall present uh, back pain has been there from before right yeah, so yeah. Uh, i would uh, definitely try to give conservative treatment a trial because in the dynamic x rays as we can see here though there is opening up and there is some uh, instability but i can't see any gross instability per se i will give a conservative treatment a trial i will evaluate her for osteoporosis uh, i will Uh, do uh, do all the lab tests uh, to um, uh, rule out secondary causes of osteoporosis do a dexa scan and manage her conservatively if the conservative treatment fails um, a, a good conservative treatment fails then i'll consider um, augmentation in this patient okay sir uh, this patient when he uh, she came that time this mri was already done and uh, this is what was her presentation um the age what did you say was the 72 age? 72 72 uh, so 72 um, um at the age of 72 i would um, um though um, i would want to also confirm with the pet scan if we are not messing out on something perfect perfect dr arun how will you treat this so uh, more or less it will be similar to uh, what dr chabda said except that uh, at one month usually i counsel the patient that now that it is one month and the fracture is still not healed and you are still painful yeah. maybe you will have to consider con uh, undergoing a procedure if you are not able to uh, tolerate a period of immobilization and suffering pain despite medication then there is a possibility we can do a, a percutaneous augmentation even at this stage but still leaving the choice with the patient and attendant at this point of time not an absolute recommendation but a relative recommendation depending upon their desire to get pain relief perfect suresh will you consider giving her a brace <laughs> like fiber molded jacket or a tailor's brace or you would like no. to no no i i won't consider giving a brace because the, it is uh, or the vertical loading can't be prevented only the forward bending may be prevented to some extent i would rather go with the rest of my um, chabra sir and dr arun but they have told conservative treatment okay let's hear it from uh, <laughs> siva siva what is your protocol in such cases yeah it's uh, interesting um i agree with everything that uh, uh my colleagues here have mentioned but interestingly in the united states uh, i think we are more aggressive with bracing um so a uh, typical protocol would be to put a patient like this in something like a tl what we call a tlso brace thoracolumbar or orthosis um but uh, uh dr pillay's point is a very good one which is that uh you know it's really vertical vertical loading that is the key not you know uh and the brace may not help too much with that but Sometimes we get upright x-rays without a brace and if we don't see any progression of kyphosis sometimes we we just do a soft brace for comfort but but most commonly um surgeons will will provide a hard you know clamshell type brace for this patient and if you see that there is some amount of pincer at D11 the cord getting you know pinched yes will you consider only brace or will you consider any uh, procedure Oh yeah, I think I think 
if if the pain is refractory or it's too severe, then definitely augmentation would be would be in the cards. Yeah. Will you consider augmentation or fixing this instability? Yeah, fi fixation also uh, definitely reasonable. Um, but I think uh, threshold would be uh, higher, especially if in in the absence of a neurological deficit, and uh, we would probably still try augmentation first. Perfect. So I think uh, from here, let's, because there are a lot of things which have come up from uh, Dr. Chabra to Dr. Siva, and uh, we all are seeing that there are different things, you know, as uh, we see these different uh, aspects of uh, mm -hmm. the investigations, blood and all this, I would like to invite Dr. Varun Agarwal to enlighten us with the investigation protocol. Varun. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shailish. So if I can share my screen. Please. Yeah. So I'll be talking a little about the evaluation uh, of such a patient. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, Varun. Perfect. Yeah. So, so when we talk about uh, the evaluation, we should remember the evaluation of the patient starts from the history itself. And we should focus on the risk factors when a patient uh, of uh, this age group presents us with a, a chronic back pain or a, even an acute back pain. Uh, we should be looking at the age, the low BMI, ethnicity, Caucasians are more susceptible than Asians and uh, least in the Africans. And if there's a family history of the fracture, others such as a low estrogen or a, a testosterone, which is very much neglected by us orthopedicians and neurosurgeons. And uh, such a patient should ideally have an endocrinal workup as well. Low calcium and vitamin D levels, inactive lifestyle, excessive alcohol or cigarette smoking, all these are the risk factors. Hyperthyroidism, <laughs> hyperthyroidism, GI conditions, use of steroids or proton pump inhibitors for prolonged durations, all these should be uh, elicited and looked into. So these are the various risk factors with a useful mnemonic known as access, alcohol use, corticosteroid use, calcium, uh, uh, which is low, low estrogen smoking and a sedentary lifestyle. So when we come up, uh, talk about the laboratory diagnosis, we should be looking at creatinine, calcium, alkaline phosphatase, assess for the renal function and the choice of treatment which we can uh, subject the patient to. Uh, if there is low calcium, we can consider uh, repleting it. Too high, con uh, consider the possibility of hyperparathyroidism. Then alkaline phosphatase to rule out osteomalacia or a Pages disease. Uh, vitamin D and 24 hour urine calcium <coughs> if that is available. Then parathyroid, testosterone or estrogen levels, 24 hour urine cortisol for Cushingoid features are there, especially in the patient. Then these days DEXA scan, which is a dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, which measures bone mineral density and approximation of bone mass. And it is a best predictor of fracture, fracture risk. Uh, standard deviation of a normal young subject is uh, manifested as a T score and age match, which is mentioned as a Z score. So it is. Used can, to... I, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, how often you consider doing a DEXA scan in a patient who is coming to you, elderly, uh, 55, 60 year old lady with back pain and X rays, looking like uh, she has osteoporosis. So DEXA scan is a useful uh, tool if it is available uh, and uh, unfortunately in my setup, in my city, it is still not very popular or available, but it is a good indicator and a good, uh, you know, measurement of your response to therapy that whatever medical management you put the patient on, what is the response and how you judge it? Given a choice, you will strongly recommend this. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, perfect. Please go ahead. Yeah. So it helps us to detect the risk for bone fracture, confirms the diagnosis of osteoporosis, determine the rate of bone loss, and most importantly, determine the response to therapy, the medical management, which we put the patient on. So this is how it looks like. This is the DEXA machine, and this is the uh, uh, kind of a report which we receive from the uh, radiology department doing the DEXA scan. The T-score, post-menopausal uh, uh, women and men, used to determine if the patient has osteoporosis, and the Z score premenopausal women used to determine bone mineral density. So this is how it looks like osteoporosis with a T score of less than minus 2.5. <laughs>
and minus 1 to minus 2.5 is the osteopenic range. So this is how we can work up the patient. And uh, other risk factors like uh, Dr. Chabra mentioned, PET scan and all for any additive pathology to distinguish pure osteoporosis from any other uh, causative agents which may have pre uh, predisposed the patient to the risk factors. Very nicely uh, said Dr. Varun and uh, you really covered the topic in a very uh, good time. Uh, I think uh, whenever the patient comes and you are in doubt, clinical history is very, very important. And uh, that can give uh, a different you know, key perspective for thinking whether it can be a myeloma because that is reasonably commonly seen in spine practice. Um, the, the first thing what we always think is whether it is osteoporotic fracture, are we seeing the fluid cleft and signs? Uh, is the patient is having any other associated issues like any history of cancer because metastasis also is common. And some of the cases we have seen lymphoma also behaving like osteoporotic fracture and was treated with mm -hmm. osteoporotic medication. Yes, Arun. So, uh, very nicely summed up. Just one small observation. Sometimes you see females in their late 40s or 50s and you do not suspect osteoporosis, but one important history of hysterectomy at a young age <clears throat> is a uh, thing that one should not miss out. Very, very, very rightly said because that is a very uh, uh, important thing. A lot of females do have hysterectomies in the late, uh, yeah, early 30s and uh, they have chances of osteoporosis uh, in an early age. <laughs> also something called as PPSO, the postpartum uh, spinal osteoporosis is a term which is described in the literature where we have seen very uh, uh, rarely, it's not common, but young girls, young females, 20, 25 years with uh, deliveries showing osteoporotic fractures and they are the few uh, interesting uh, aspects in this and we need uh, a proper evaluation for these patients perfect and other, yes some, yes some other people, some other people with uh, the, those who need steroid therapy like uh, asthma then rheumatoid arthritis SLE, these young people also get osteoporosis and compression fractures very often absolutely absolutely uh, very true, postmenopausal and senile is common, but these are the things which are additional where we have to be careful to assess the patient well. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Varun. We proceed uh, with Dr. Bhave's uh, case, uh, Dr. Arvind Bhave. We are planning for mixing uh, a topic and interesting case so that we can proceed. Dr. Bhave, sir, please uh, share your screen. Yes. Okay. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm sharing this uh, standard routine case, which most of us are seeing in our day-to-day -day practice. A 74 years female patient who was diabetic, hypertensive, had angina, and also had urinary infection. She suffered from fractured spine while traveling in a bus from Pune to Mumbai. And, uh, Asiad bus is very uh, famous on this part of the country. And then at Mumbai, she was given conservative treatment in the form of bed rest, calcium supplements, control of her medical problems, and uh, brace as and when required. And uh, this happened in April to July 2003. And this was her uh, picture. This was the first picture, just minimum compression, as you see here. That time, the conservative treatment... Sir, sir, even. sir you need to... Uh, then the next thing, this is a follow-up. Yeah, and this point, she has developed a collapse with a small cavity inside. You can see... Sir, sir, sorry, uh, it, it's not seen on the screen. The next slide. This is not getting shared? No, it is shared, but case uh, one it is seen. You need yeah, to... This one? So, okay. you need to go to the presentation mode on the bottom right. There is a presentation mode. Mm. So in the PPT itself, slide. Uh, the, okay. Yeah, I have gone actually. Okay. Or you can just put the cursor. Okay, here. Can you see? It is not gone in. Okay. No. Yes, now it is seen, and you can put a PowerPoint mode. Yeah, it is in PowerPoint mode. 
can you see yes yes we can see but you can enlarge also sir <clears throat> sir make it presentation mode in the powerpoint yeah yeah now it's better uh, yeah yeah oh, oh, just just on the, this side no no uh, one yes. one step left yes, yeah this correct. one uh, yeah Okay, I think we can proceed. That's not a problem. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, we have done her vertebroplasty. You can see the vascular cavity, which has been properly filled. And these are the X-rays post-operatively, post-vertebroplasty. Sir, you need to uh, go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> and this was her clinical presentation. Patient had gone. She did even chardham yes. yatra also. Sir, and sir, she came. Sir, Bhavi, sir, Bhavi, sir. Sorry to interrupt. You need to move to the next slide. You need to yeah. manually go to the slides, sir. It's not showing automatically. Manually? On the, on on the left, left panel. Uh, yeah. Go back, sir. One, one, one more back, backwards. This one. This ah, one. This one yeah. Now you, yeah, yeah. Now it is seen. Huh. So I will go on the PPT mode. Yeah, the, the right one, sir. That just, yeah, yeah, just right to what you are pressing. This big one, yeah. Single. Just press it. Somehow it is not opening up. Or should I start new share? Okay. No, sir. I think this is okay. This, this is all okay. right. Okay. Yeah, this is okay. You can just scroll the left side uh, when you are talking about the slides. Yeah. This is okay, sir. Yeah. So this was our clinical picture. You can see hardly see any scar over here. And this lady performed even Chardham Yatra. No, no sir. You need to. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, you are not, uh, the next picture is not clicked. You are talking about that scar, but we have so you the vertebroplasty picture. Scrolling from the left panel each slide, whenever you switch. Each slide, huh? you have to scroll from the each slide when you are talking. One by one from the left panel. Okay. And this is five years follow up. Can you see? No, sir. sir no, 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 no. You need to. Oh, just... yeah. That is not, huh? that brown thing should come to the slide. No, I'm not. I'm seeing something else actually. Yeah. Now you've gone ahead. You wanted to show the scar. You can just go back to one slide. This one? Yes, yes. Huh. correct. Yes, sir. Now we can see that lady clinical picture and a vertebral yeah. plastic picture. Yeah. 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 So, and this is a five years follow. -up. There is no collapse, no adjacent fracture. So, Cumel's disease or avascular necrosis is a classical indication for vertebroplasty. Perfect. I think uh, in, in a very uh, simplistic way, you have shown uh, that uh, vertebroplasty is a good answer for pain relief. And yeah. uh, can you enlighten us on what is the mechanism, sir, how the pain relief occurs in vertebroplasty? Yeah. Uh, the cavity which is caused causes sort of instability inside the vertebra and okay. that causes a lot of pain because of the movement of the fracture fragments. Okay. Also, there is collection of the fluid that makes Correct. spinal instability. <laughs> so, at this point of time, what we do is we stabilize by injection of cement, which is supposed to have empirical uh, function in the form of stabilization of these fracture fragments. Okay. Second is... Uh, the thermal energy, what is released or temperature which is released. Correct. Uh, uh, polymethyl methacrylate that is yeah. high and that causes burning of the uh, adjacent nerve endings which cause pain. So that yeah. is also in addition one of the theories causing pain relief. Perfect. So stabilization and the pain uh, and uh, nerve uh, pain sensation is reduced. These are the two yeah. main mechanisms by which we stabilize the fracture and that is how patient's pain reduces. Very well said, sir. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Siva, uh, there are a lot of the papers and people are talking about what is the fate of the vertebral cement. Vertebroplasty is a procedure started by a French radiologist in 1986 <laughs> for a tumor and uh, now we have reasonable data. But what is the fate of the cement? Any uh, inputs, Siva? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, honestly, 
in the U.S., we don't really fo follow these patients uh, longitudinally for many years. Uh, actually, interventional radiologists are doing most of the vertebroplasties in the United States now. It is actually sort of the surgeons have actually given up many of the many of the vertebroplasties. So I personally don't have a great sort of long term follow up either like clinically or radiographically. Um, okay. So I may not be the best one to answer, but um, I, I will say it's, it is ge like a geographically and culturally, uh, it's probably not a good thing in the United States that we have sort of given up a lot of vertebroplasties to the radiologist because it's a, it's a great procedure. Um, but uh, maybe some others may have a better idea of what, what happens long term. Yes, Arun. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, personally speaking, uh, it's been quite some time since I did vertebroplasty. Most of my cement augmentations are kyphoplasties nowadays uh, for the sake of additional safety that I feel is inbuilt in the kyphoplasty procedure. Okay, okay. Yes, Suresh? Yeah, <clears throat> routinely I don't do vertebroplasty, but in indicated cases, it, it is a good procedure, but okay. mostly I don't do the vertebroplasty. Chabra, sir? Yeah, um, I would prefer to do a kyphoplasty because the chance of cement embolization, cement leakage either local or distal is less with a kyphoplasty procedure. But some patients who can't afford because kyphoplasty is a more expensive procedure, but would want to mention that we can get kyphoplasty. It's quite cheap now and you may not need to do it with a double balloon. You may do with a single balloon and uh, still preserve the safety. But if the patient still can't afford those uh, subsidized costs, we, we, uh, we, uh, vertebroplasty is a good procedure, which can be safely done. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Ch Chabra, sir, this uh, Dr. Bhave's case is 2003 and five-year mm. follow-up at that time. So I think mm. that time, uh, <laughs> mainly this procedure was invoked. And uh, nowadays, yes, safety is slightly more if you see, because Kaifan, uh, the balloon gives you uh, the scaffolding a proper shape where you can uh, put your cement. And we have better quality cement also, which has come. So I think uh, all these things are adding safety and the price is also reduced quite significantly in Kaifoplasty. Thank you, uh, Bhavi, sir, Thank for you. this Thank interesting you. case. We would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Nishad to just enlighten us about the current classification. Is there any classification or what it is? Nishad, over to you. Dr. Nishad Sindhu. <coughs> Uh, thank you, sir, and good evening to all the eminent faculties. I'm very much honored to be here with uh, all the stalwarts. So I'll be sharing my screen now. Yeah, this is a recent classification, and uh, let's see what Nishad has to say. So I'll be talking about... Uh, uh, the fracture classification, which is given by German Society for Ortho of Orthopedics and Traumatology for osteoporosis. So, coming to the highlights of the classification, it was the it was studied on a 707 osteoporotic fracture, the fracture anatomy, and it was uh, done in multicentric level. Uh, insufficient fractures, maybe traumatic and atraumatic, both the type of classic uh, fractures were included in this. And for diagnosis, they included all the three classifications, including X-ray, CT scan, and MRI. So this is the overview. They classified it into five types, OF1 to OF5. Uh, now coming to individual types. So coming to the first one, OF1. So in this... On X-ray as well as on CT scan, we do not see any pathological findings. On MRI, on STIR images, we see hyperintensity. In the image which is there uh, on the right side, we can see that on CT scan, there is no fracture line visible. However, on uh, STIR images, we can see hyperintensity on MRI. Coming to the next one is OF2, where some deformation we can see either superior end plate or inferior end plate. Few times uh, posterior wall may also be involved, but very uh, little. So it can be classified as impression fracture where mainly superior end plate is involved. 
on the ct scan also we can see that inferior end plate posterior wall is intact however superior end plate is fractured the third one is uh, we can label it as incomplete burst fracture where superior end plate along with posterior wall is involved and uh, this has potential of uh, collapse in future coming to the fourth one this is this can be labeled as complete burst where superior end plate along with posterior entire posterior wall fracture is involved it can be classified pincer type of fracture can also be classified into of4 where both the superior as well as inferior end plates are involved in the ct scan given on the lower side we can see that both the end plates are along with the posterior wall fracture with retropulsion of the fracture fragment on the fifth uh, type uh, they specifically uh, classified the fracture where distraction and rotational injury is there along with the a uh, complete burst fracture where posterior ligamentous complex is also involved so the guidelines which are given by this study group is that uh, of4 and of5 in this type definitely surgical management is indicated in of1 and of2 it is essentially stable fracture which can be conserved in 3 both the line of management can be tried in case of uh, increase in the kyphosis and collapse of the fracture surgical management can be uh, opted thank you perfect thank you nishad for a wonderful presentation uh, at least we all know this is a very recent i think 2019 classification until date there were various different classifications but this is really coming for the treatment protocols and i think it is widely uh, uh, used nowadays your inputs chabra sir on this classification Uh, uh, no, this is a classification which has been validated also recently, and um, I work with Dr. Shnake uh, uh, in the AO Spine Knowledge Forum Trauma, where we have done this, and um, uh, this uh, is um, uh, uh, the most accepted classification as of date across the globe. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Nishad, for a wonderful presentation and at least enlightening you, us about the current status. I would request Dr. Varun to present his case, which will be followed up, which will be followed by Dr. Bhushan's medical management. Over to you, Dr. Varun. Yes, Varun. Any issue? Sorry, uh, is it not showing? Now, now we can hear you, and you it can share the screen. Who has fracture for more than one year? There are so is it uh, back audible now? Like Discarniation or a spinal stenosis. It, it, it is audible. You yeah, can yeah. now share. There is a radicular pain related to a discarniation. All these are poor. No, no, no. It is not shared. The screen is not seen, Varun. Last match, man. Teasing. Hello, sir. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please click on share screen. Yeah. So, uh, just wait. I think there's some technical issue. I'm just sorting it out. should we ask uh, dr bushan to uh, yeah, yeah for me yeah. all the participants attending yeah. this talk and essi for inviting me for this lecture i am dr varun kumar agarwal associate professor of orthoped so before we move on to the procedure we should know which are uh, how to select a good candidate for kyphoplasty the patient who tends to respond best are those who have one to three levels of fracture there is a focal pain and tenderness corresponding to the level of edema on mri the fracture is present for less than 2 months there is a recent worsening of fracture and there is no sclerosis of the fracture a poor candidate is the one who has fracture for more than one year there are other causes for back pain such as a disc herniation or a spinal stenosis or facet or sacroiliac joint disease there is a radicular pain So these are the instruments and how to set the table for the procedure. We use thirteen gauge bone biopsy needles. 
and we use lower lock syringes so that we can have a good fixation of the syringe to the needle and there is no leakage of any substance. We do the process under, under IV sedation or local anesthesia in, in which we use 1% lignocaine with adrenaline and 0.5% bupivacaine on the bone. General anesthesia is rarely reported. So the main advantage of local anesthesia is that it allows the surgeon to communicate with the patient and to determine the cement injection speed, anticipate any corrective measures that need to be done and abort the procedure if any problem is happening on the table. While the local anesthetic is acting, we give an injection of antibiotic along with painkillers and perinol preoperatively. And I, uh, personally, I prefer to use a nasal cannula as I find an, an awake patient is more acceptable of a nasal cannula than an oxygen mask patient. The patient is monitored and uh, IV lines are established. There is continuous intraoperative mon monitoring with ECG and uh, patient in the room is set up, the patient is to be placed in extension using radiolucent surgical tables or even bowls. The patient is placed prone with padded rolls and the lower legs are also padded to remove pressure from the fracture and to prevent any so. The, make sure that the patient is lying comfortably and comfortable. And prior to the skin incision, always check that your fluoroscopy is adequate and you can visualize all the bones properly. The patient is prepared with meticulous sterile technique. One should not treat it as a casual OPD interpretation. So this is the true AP image in which the pedicles in the upper half of the vertebral body, the spinous process is equidistant between the pedicles and the end plates are parallel. So similarly, a true lateral view is needed in which the pedicles are superimposed on each other and the end plates are parallel. So this is a short video of the procedure. So as you can see, uh, we just put the Jamshedi needle under fluoroscopic guidance. In the AP and the lateral. 75 year old lady with pain in the back and bedridden for four months with an osteoporotic compression fracture at L1 level. So local anesthesia is given and a Jamshedi needle is inserted. The pedicle is targeted under AP view and, the, and it is slowly advanced after confirming in the lateral view. The needle is again advanced to be in the body. And once it is placed in the body, then we remove the stylet and place a guide wire and exchange this Jamshedi needle with the working cannula. We can gently tap the guide wire so that it doesn't displace us. And now we remove the Jamshedi needle. Carefully, uh, not to displace the guide wire. You can hold the guide wire with the help of a forceps. And then the procedure is repeated on the opposite side. Local anesthetic is again given. And the Jamshedi needle is first placed in the AP view and then confirmed in the lateral view. And when you have adequately cannulated the pedicle, you can again put in a guide wire and exchange the Jamshedi needle for the working cannula. You can aspirate the edematous fluid in the fracture cavity, which is seen on the MRI, which confirms that the needle has been placed in the correct position inside the vertebral body. And you can send it for biopsy or culture. Another tip is to inject the 
normal saline in one needle and it comes out of the other needle which confirms that both the needles are in the uh, correct position inside the vertebral body and then you can just aspirate this you know, normal saline to make the cavity dry again. So next is to inject radio-opaque dye to confirm whether there is any leakage or not. And if the dye is well contained inside the vertebral body, one can be reasonably sure that the cement is not going to leak. To economize the usage of cement and use the same packet of cement in multiple vertebras, one can take out the cement powder in a 50 ml syringe and the liquid monomer in another 20 ml syringe so that we have 1 ml liquid for every 2 milligram of the powder. And so in this video, I have uh, taken out the powder in a 50 ml syringe and empty around 20 milligram of that powder at uh, one time in a bowl. This allows us to be very precise in the measurements. And a 20 milligram of powder is emptied into the bowl. The rest is set aside to use subsequently in another vertebra if it is needed. And set aside the powder for a subsequent procedure on the next vertebra. Post operatively, the needle site is dressed and there is strict bed dress for two to three hours with monitoring of the vital signs and a neurological. The patient is discharged three hours after the procedure and follow up, follow up is done on the next day, one week. So my protocol for these osteoporotic compression fractures is I do it in cases less than six weeks old who need to be hospitalized or there is a failure of conservative treatment after three months. I choose vertebroplasty for all except when the middle column is involved, I tend to go in for kyphoplasty. However, both of these procedures must be treated with the respect as its application without appropriate preparation and physician knowledge can quickly produce increased pain, permanent neurological in Thanks. Yes, Varun. Wonderful presentation. I felt like I'm watching a winning IPL match. Flawless. <laughs> Dovara mat puchna. <laughs> I think everyone can understand principles, how we should do it. And in case if there is a difficulty, we can refer the patient to you for kyphoplasty. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, uh, Arun, quick comments. Oh, he explained it very nicely and uh, well done procedures. And uh, as he already said that uh, you cannot take them lightly, even when they look excellent in the expert hands. There have been uh, cases where cement leakage has played havoc and one should be watching each fraction of a ml milliliter of cement while it is being injected in the Siam. And at the fir very first incidence that you suspect a leak, you should abandon it rather than pushing your luck in uh, segmenting it that vertebra. That is the only word of caution that I would add. Bhave sir, quick comment. Yeah, fantastic uh, video presentation. I think it is everything is self-explained very nicely. So congratulations, Varun. For <laughs> Thank you, sir. So uh, I have a comment. Actually, I use a vertebroplasty cement, which is a little delayed setting cement. So actually, you have very much control. That gives you more time to manipulate also. More time and more control over what you are doing. So just fill the anterior one-third, wait for a while, then go back, go for middle, middle one-third, and then subsequently fill the last. So it gives yeah, you a little Usually I don't feel the posterior. So chances of leak are much reduced. And main wet bearing column is middle column and anterior column. So you may not do anything for the posterior column. 
yeah and uh, nowadays uh, recently we have done couple of cases of this vertebral body stenting the stentoplasty uh, that is come in india and uh, that is also showing very uh, good restoration basically in selective cases not for all but kyphoplasty stands tall uh, today uh, for sure in uh, most of the cases we are, thank you varun we move on to the next presentation medical management of osteoporosis is one of the very important topics uh, and uh, 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 dr bhushan patil will be presenting this talk today over to you dr bhushan uh, good evening to all the eminent faculty i am really honored to be able to present given an opportunity to present in front of the national and international stalwarts uh, i'm sharing my screen now Uh, so the medical management of osteoporosis. Uh, first, is is my screen visible? Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, first, in before treating the osteoporosis, uh, we should understand uh, which patients need to be treated or which which candidates are uh, uh, suitable for treatment. So this uh, flowchart really explains it well. Uh, any woman more than 40, 65 years of age or any man more than 70 years of age uh, needs to get a DEXA scan done. And if the T-score is less than minus 2.5 or if the patient has a history of hip or spine fracture, then the uh, candidate is definitely up for treatment. Or if the T-score is between minus 1 and minus 2.5 and there is an increased fracture risk, then we have to do the FRAX assessment tool, the 10-year fracture risk probability. And if it, the hip fracture score is more than 3% and for other or the other major osteoporotic fracture score is more than 20%, then definitely the candidate is up for osteoporotic treatment. Now, uh, the next question comes is who should have a bone density test done? So a woman more than 65 years of age or men more than 70 years of age or younger postmenopausal women and men with age of between 50 to 69 years with clinical risk factors for uh, osteoporotic fracture. And anyone with a low trauma fracture with more than 50 years of age needs to get a bone density scan done. Uh, coming to the risk factors, the risk factors have been uh, explained really well by uh, Dr. Varun. Uh, but I'll just enunciate. They are age, previous fracture, a steroid therapy, tobacco use, excessive alcohol intake, secondary osteoporosis, family history of osteoporosis, low body weight, and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, coming to non-pharmacological management uh, of uh, osteoporosis, the patient needs to be given enough calcium and vitamin D. Patient needs to be counseled for good physical activity, which includes brisk walking or daily walking for at least 45 minutes. Weight-bearing exercises as tolerated and as per age. As smoking and alcohol to be avoided as much as possible and to maintain a healthy weight. These are certain recommendations from the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation, which they recommend at least 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week and strength training at least two to three times a week. So uh, how much calcium is recommended? So the daily recommended allowance is around 1000 to 1200 milligrams uh, per day. So these are some of the dietary sources of calcium, which... Uh, ingredients so milk contains around one cup of uh, one cup of milk contains around 300 milligrams your one cup of yogurt contains around 300 milligrams uh, orange juice contains one, uh, 260 milligrams and one cup of broccoli contains around 90 milligrams so these are some of the calcium rich foods which can be advised to the patients and while uh, 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 prescribing calcium supplements make sure that at least uh, 500 milligram of calcium is prescribed once and uh, it should not be taking more than that because the body's ability to uh, metabolize calcium is only 500 milligram at one particular time. If the patient needs more than that, then he should be prescribed maybe a 500 milligram dose twice daily. Uh, this is the recommended dose for vitamin D. Uh, it's around 800 to 1000 international units per day. Uh, in cases of vitamin D deficiency, uh, we uh, give a dose of 60,000 international unit once a week for six to eight weeks, followed by a maintenance therapy of 1,500 to 2,000 international units per day. Another protocol of uh, vitamin D fortification would be a 60,000 international per month dose, 
which is given in apparently healthy subjects with vitamin D deficiency. And uh, vitamin D levels need not be checked regularly. They can We can wait for at least a minimum of three to four months to allow for the attainment of a steady state of vitamin D levels. Coming to the pharmacological management, there are two uh, 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 major parts of treatment of uh, osteoporosis. One is the anabolic drugs. The other part is the anti-resorptive uh, medications. Uh, anabolic drugs are the teriparatide and anti-resorptive medications are the bisphosphonates and denosumab. Coming to teriparatide, it is the only anabolic drug uh, which has direct action on the osteoblast activity. It improves the bone architecture. The recommended duration is 24 months. But the disadvantage of teriparatide are it requires a daily subcutaneous dosage. It requires cold storage. And evaluation of serum PTH and calcium levels are important prior to initiation of therapy. Coming to the... Uh, uh, Bisphosphonates, these are the most commonly used anti resorptive medications. We have the oral uh, alendronate, which is given 70 milligrams per week, or the IV zolendronic acid, which is given once yearly. So, a drug holiday can be given in uh, bisphosphonates, uh, which is recommended is uh, after five years for an oral medication and after three years for an IV medication. The drug holiday will not lead to a rebound increase in bone loss on stoppage of the therapy. And injection teriparatide can be used during the drug holiday. The side effects of bisphosphonate are renal toxicity, osteonecrosis of the jaw, and atypical femoral fractures. But osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical femoral fractures are seen with long-term bisphosphonate use of more than five years. And the risks are very low as compared to the benefits offered by the bisphosphonate therapy. So the bisphosphonate uh, needs to be taken properly and the patients need to be counseled regarding the bisphosphonate therapy. It needs to be taken on empty stomach because it requires an acidic medium to act. The patient needs to sit upright for at least an hour uh, of not at least 30 minutes after the intake. It, it needs to be taken without any other medication and the calcium supplements need to be taken at a different time. It is pertinent to note that alendronate is not effective against glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. And uh, imandronate is not uh, effective in men. Uh, coming to the uh, denosumab, it is a monoclonal antibody to uh, rank L. It reduces the survival of the osteoclast. It is a very safe drug. It can be used safely uh, in patients of uh, renal failure where bisphosphonates are avoided. The dose is 60 mg subcutaneously once every six months. However, the... Uh, on discontinuation of denosumab, there is a rebound increase in uh, bone turnover and accelerated bone loss. So, drug holiday cannot be given for injection denosumab. So, this is the uh, uh, duration of therapy which is recommended. Uh, we start with the injection teriparatide, which is recommended for a two years of duration. We follow it up with an anti resorptive medication, either a bisphosphonate for at least one to five years. Or if bisphosphonate is not started, then a denosumab for at least 5 to 10 years. And then that needs to be coupled later with a bisphosphonate to prevent uh, accelerated bone loss after the denosumab is stopped. Uh, this is an overview of the uh, medications and their uh, side effects. Yeah, okay. So the take-home message is that osteoporotic fractures are serious but preventable. Lifestyle changes can slow but not reverse the bone loss. When used appropriately, osteoporotic medications are safe and effective. We need to identify the people at risk early and ensure compliance of the drugs. Thank you. Thank you, Bhushan, for a very simplistic and nice presentation. At least uh, it has enlightened most of the top uh, medications which uh, are taken routinely. And nowadays, a lot of combination therapies are being talked about in endocrinology and rheumatic uh, societies. Um, I just would like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Chabra, sir, Yeah. Uh, what is uh, your protocol? Uh, whether a whether, uh, lot of people are now, it's very, uh, you know, they are very happy with this denosumab because it is once in six months, Indian patient tolerates it well, results are comparable in various studies, but it's it's anti resorptive and teriparatide is uh, something which is not anti resorptive so what is your uh, take on these two molecules when you use which drug uh, 
Normally, I would have used teriparatide for only severe osteoporosis. And WHO defines severe osteoporosis as uh, a T-score less than minus 2.5 with a fragility fracture. So if you also go by the various guidelines as they grade, those at very high risk of uh, subsequent fractures are uh, uh, to be uh, given anabolic treatment with teriparatine. However, uh, denosumab uh, is also quite effective, quite efficacious. And um, uh, very often, patients either do not have a compliance to daily administration of teriparatide or because teriparatide is a bit more expensive because it has to be given daily than denosumab. So very often in such patients also, uh, because of uh, patient preference or because of uh, affordability issues, we have now been using denosumab with uh, good good uh, results uh, in um, means in those with severe osteoporosis. And okay. uh, 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 since we need to give it uh, twice in a year, uh, the compliance is quite good. I just want to ask: there is there is a lot of uh, thing you know, in various institute nowadays. People are referring uh, osteoporosis to the endocrinologist. Maybe I think it's good in difficult or severe cases, but what is uh, the current status of this treatment in U.S., Shiva? Yeah, um, at most uh, quaternary centers or academic institutions, it is standard of care to refer patients to uh, like a bone metabolic subspecialty endocrinologist if there is a diagnosis of uh, definitely osteoporosis, sometimes even osteopenia. Um, and so, uh, you know, honestly, I don't, it's probably a little bit of overkill. Um, uh, I think there's a tendency to like over, over consult and refer, but, um, that's standard of care. Uh, and so especially for elective patients, say with the spinal deformity, uh, older patient, um, and you're doing preoperative testing and you discover osteoporosis, then we will automatically refer to bone metabolic specialist and then they will determine which medication to start and then they will also sort of make the ultimate determination for how long the patient should be on that medication before considering surgery so we, we really sort of defer defer to them okay okay what about you dr pillai yeah the osteoporosis all the patients i would go with depending on the severity of osteoporosis I recommend a modification in their diet with uh, adequate uh, protein, vitamins, calcium, all those. Then regular exercise programs, muscle strengthening, bone strengthening, and uh, cardio. And if the osteoporosis is severe, then uh, according to DEXA scores, then I will initiate on uh, teriparatide and uh, for two years, followed by denosumab or uh, Alendronate or similar bisphosphonates. Okay, okay. What's what's there in Delhi, Dr. Arun? <clears throat> so uh, you asked one question to Varun in the beginning. When do you use DEXA? So in uh, my cases, I use DEXA quite re uh, frequently to decide which patients to go for denosumab and which to go for uh, teriparatide. So the ones which are minus three and have a history of more than two fractures, I would usually lean towards teriparatide. And the uh, ones which are above that, then I'll, be, for the sake of ease of uh, giving the drug and uh, compliance, denosumab is pretty effective. Uh, and it is pretty safe if for, a, for a wide range of patients where other drugs may be contraindicated. So that is one. Uh, and... Uh, uh, you you ask something more like you know, whether whether there is a trend of asking the uh, endocrinologist or rheumatologist ah, for so usually most of my osteoporosis patients i manage by myself rarely if ever there is a mixed presentation the patient is having some other metabolic disorder uh, then in that case we may uh, take an opinion uh, from the endocrinologist one thing i would add here is that the elderly ladies which we commonly see for osteoporosis and we have to treat 
uh, even if we tell them to do exercises, they may not do it. So I, in my own practice, I just tell them to keep doing as much of daily chores as they can in their household. So it is like keeping them active to keep the bones loading. So okay. that is yeah. one thing that I add. Yeah. Generally, they say denosumab is quite safe uh, and it can be given in most of the patients. Teriparatide, I think it's very important for all of us to understand. We have to check vitamin D levels, vitamin uh, PTH. These two things are very, very important. Serum calcium, vitamin D, PTH and uh, creatinine. These two, three things are important when I personally do uh, uh, start the uh, teriparatide because when there is low vitamin D, you need to elevate the values and then start. It's very, very important. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bhushan, for a wonderful presentation. We move on to the next. I would invite Dr. Ahilan Siva Ganeshan from Philadelphia. Over to you, Siva. Yeah, Shailesh, as the presentation comes up, I would also want to add that you very rightly suggested that vitamin D should be uh, appropriate in these patients. But also we need to rule out any history of malignancy. And if yeah. at the slightest doubt, we should get a PET done to rule out malignancy because yeah. it would be yeah. contraindicated in uh, such cases. Perfect. Perfect, sir. Yes, you are. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so this will be relatively brief. Um, I don't have the preoperative imaging, um, but hopefully we can use this as an opportunity to talk about some sort of new adjunctive technologies. Um, so this is just a quick case I'll show uh, from about a year ago um, where we treated a symptomatic uh, patient with mechanical axial back pain from uh, a significant osteoporotic fracture with uh, posterior um, uh, screw rod fixation. Um, we actually used um, uh, robotic assisted uh, pedicle screw placement for this uh, this this surgery. And so I think um, maybe it's an opportunity to uh, discuss the role of navigation and robotics um, in the treatment of these patients. Um, our rationale um, in this case was that if we have the option of using either image guidance or robotics, it gives us extra confidence in the accuracy of the pedicle screw placement so that, and in this case, we used fenestrated screws to allow for, you know, cement uh, administration through the screws. Um, but it really gave us the extra confidence to maximize uh, cement administration. Um, and on top of that, uh, as, as everyone knows, whether it's image guidance or robotics, you can plan screw dimensions, both in terms of diameter and length that really maximize pedicle fill and maximize sort of bony fixation, um, you know, separate from the cement augmentation itself. So um, I'm curious whether, you know, the surgeons on the panel uh, think this is sort of, uh, you know, some may say it's a little bit unnecessary, you know, if you are confident in your fluoroscopic guided, uh, you know, percutaneous or open pedicle screw placement that this is not necessary. Um, uh, others may say, yeah, it's a nice adjunct to have if it's available. Uh, so kind of curious what uh, everyone's thoughts are. Yeah. Can I just interrupt, Shiva? Yes, please. Yeah. We have uh, Dr. Chabra who has used robot and uh, Varun who is using OAM. We'll take their views. Chabra, sir. Yeah, I totally agree with um, Shiva in that, um, uh, see, accuracy becomes uh, a bit of a concern when you go in for MIS procedures. And um, uh, if you have a technology available and if you have access to it, uh, there is clear-cut evidence that there is better accuracy. Two, it is not only accuracy, you know, with MIS comes increased radiation. So with robotics, you reduce the risk of radiation both to the patient and to the uh, surgeon. And there is clear-cut evidence that in such cases, there are less chances of complications, there are less chances of facet violations, there are less chances of revision surgeries. Uh, uh, so overall, better outcomes uh, with robotic, less duration of hospital stay. So if we have access to it, and if the patient can afford it, uh, I think uh, this is uh, uh, a technology which is definitely useful. Yes, uh, Varun. Very rightly said, uh, sir. I totally agree with you. And especially in these kind of cases where uh, sometimes the collapsed vertebra, you are not able to make out the pedicles even. 
even those cases you are able to cannulate and put in your jamshedi with the help of navigation or robotics or these you know helpful technologies so in this case uh, perhaps i would have even put some cement in the fractured vertebra because that allows us these technologies allows us uh, you know to judge where uh, you know we are placing our jamshedi needle where we are placing our screws and even in some trajectories which are not possible on the uh, fluoroscopy that we can achieve that yeah uh, i just would like to add we have published uh, our precious pedicle in osteoporotic spine uh, in european spine and around 172 pedicles and uh, the accuracy was 99.6% and uh, i think that is very very important uh, when we are using a longer screw we can use uh, the screws which are double cortical you know you can go to the anterior cortex also that's an additional advantage for uh, uh these kind of uh, difficult scenarios because at times we don't get a very good hold and if you get a good uh, anterior plus uh, you know two cortex that's a very good uh, strength for the bone and um, i think it is definitely going to come everywhere thank you yeah, Shiva, well, because there is a big yeah, role well, uh, these things yeah. never two, two additional yeah. points i would make is that uh as I think as everyone knows there have been some very good meta analyses that have recently been published comparing robot assisted pedicle screw placement to traditional navigation versus you know open or fluoroscopy based and uh there is a you know a, a significant advantage to robot assisted screw placement on these meta analyses some may say well you know a marginal difference even if it's a statistically significant what does it really matter but these patients where medial breach of a screw or malposition of screw the clinical consequence in terms of cement extravasation is so significant that that slight advantage in accuracy i think becomes paramount um so i so i agree with everyone that i think if you have the technology available it's good it's good to use uh, and then secondly also you know uh, my mentor at hss you know shiraz kreshi is a very uh, sort of uh, avid user of the robot he now routinely places even for you know non osteoporotic patients 85 diameter screws uh, uh, in, in patients of so very large screws, you know, bicortical maximum pedicle fill. I think that sort of extra robust fixation can, al can also help. Um, uh, the, the downside of course, is that you need to have a revision strategy. So, uh, if you ever have to come back and, and uh, upsize the screw, there may not be much pedicle left, but, but I think those are some of the advantages of the, of the preoperative planning, uh, that you can, that you can take advantage of with navigation or robotics. Perfect. Thank you, Shiva, for this enlightening robotic and uh, navigation uh, topic, because this is going to be the future and all of us will be needing it. I would uh, like to invite Dr. Arun to share his uh, case scenario. Thank you, Shiva. <clears throat> Is my screen visible? Yes. So uh, I'm not going to share cases, uh, just adding on to the classification that was uh, presented. Yes. Uh, I'm sharing my experience with using this particular picture as a uh, standard for my plan of care. Many times we see uh, in old, uh, old ladies osteoporotic fractures, you see an innocuous looking fracture, you recommend feeling that the patient needs a procedure but then you the patient doesn't agree and then at two months or three months down the lane they come and the fracture is nicely healed and then you have a similar looking fracture on an x-ray and you feel that okay this can be managed conservatively and two months down the lane it just collapses like anything and then the pain continues so you wonder is there a way how you can similar looking fractures and then you can find out a way how they are going to behave so this was a, uh, a nice paper uh, from Japan, published quite some time ago, but uh, not very commonly. I, I got introduced it to quite late. So these are the five fracture patterns simply seen on x-rays. You don't need an MRI or anything else. So you can see these fractures. The upper two ones are the concave type and the dented type, which usually reflect of a good prognosis. And the three bottom ones are the swelled front type, the bow shaped type, which is actually a combination of a concave superior end plate fracture and a, uh, uh, a dent combination. And then there is a projectile types. 
So I'll just show you a few examples. You see, this is a simple dented fracture here on the side L1. So you can see a small dent and it continues to heal very nicely without any intervention. Then you have a swelled front. If you see the picture on the front L1, the height is not lost. There is only a simple osteoporotic fracture. Just a few weeks down the lane, it collapses like anything. So if you see a swelled front in the beginning, you may not go ahead with a procedure right at the time, but then you will be a little more alert in following these patients at a relatively frequent interval rather than the conventional three or six weeks intervals that we may do, uh, follow them. Now, this is again a bow-shaped fracture, as I said, which is a combination of a superior concave and plate fracture along with a dent. So it, in this combination, this is again likely to uh, collapse more easily. So again, a candidate for a careful observation and sometimes you can go ahead for an early augmentation in such cases to avoid doing a augmentation with screw fixation in uh, future. And the third uh, negative prognosis is for the uh, projectile type fracture where you see a uh, beak in the upper or the middle part of the uh, junction of the upper and middle uh, anteriorly. These fractures again tend to go into uh, non-union and uh, further collapse of height. So uh, these are the things which I uh, employ uh, very frequently in my clinical practice to differentiate from the ones which I'm going to conserve very uh, enthusiastically and the ones which I'm going to look at very carefully in the uh, weeks when we are monitoring them or sometimes uh, quickly recommending a procedure to avoid a bigger procedure in such elderly people. So uh, that's uh, what I wanted to add from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is the words of wisdom. That's what I can say uh, because, you know, a lot of things at times and we have seen uh, patients getting treated for uh, osteoporotic fractures and uh, sometimes uh, the pathology comes as different. A lot of time we treat patients with conservative treatment and there is a collapse and retropulsion and neurological deficit also. These are certain things which are not in anyone's hand, but this is a practice which uh, helps us uh, to understand there are possibilities that there can be a worsening. It, it's, it's very important to counsel the patient well, explain and pros and cons of both the things so that there should not be a problem. They also understand this is the problem and it can uh, go this side or that side. Most of the time, 90%, I think, uh, conservative treatment really works well. Thank you, Arun, for enlightening us with this. And we move on to the next speaker, Dr. Suresh Pillai. Yeah. Dr. Bhushan, can you please uh, share the screen? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, Suresh. Slide, uh, good evening, all of you. It's a wonderful session so far. So it's a different uh, different perspective. Maybe I have done this uh, case in 2005. This lady, 62-year-old lady, <coughs> presented with after a trivial fall. She had difficulty walking and uh, buckling, buckling of her knees while walking. So she was evaluated for a pathological fracture as well, but it was, the tests were normal. So shall I uh, request them and faculty to comment on the their way of how to proceed? Yeah, so let's ask uh, Siva, Dr. Island. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. So um, the patient, <laughs> Radiographically has cord compression, but I missed, was there a neurological deficit as well? Yeah, initially she didn't have, and then she was followed up conservatively, but subsequently she developed the uh, deficit. 
Yeah, this is a very interesting case. So, you know, um, one option uh, would be to do a transpedicular decompression and fusion uh, to address the ventral cord compression from the retropulsed fragment. Um, uh, and then, you know, either two levels up or two levels down for uh, posterior, you know, fixation and fusion. Um, I have, there are, you know, another thought here to save fusion segments is to do a corpectomy uh, and place uh, either a cage of some sort or autographed and then to do a shorter segment of fixation um, depending on the age of the patient. But I think in my hands, um, I would do a transpedicular transpedicular decompression. I, I actually enjoy using ultrasound in these cases. Um, once you do the laminectomy and the facetectomies, you can use intraoperative ultrasound to actually visualize the ventral cord compression. And then as you decancellate um, and tamp the uh, retropulse fragments forward, you can actually evaluate the adequacy of the ventral, the ventral uh, decompression with ultrasound um, uh, to, to ensure that, you know, you have, uh, achieved the goals. Um, uh, obviously, you know, O-arm is another great adjunct there where you can actually get a, a spin afterwards and ensure that the, the fragments have been pushed forward. Yeah. Perfect. Bobby, sir. Yeah. Uh, for our settings, I think, uh, what he has said is transpedicular de de decompression uh, confirm total decompression and then go for long segment fixation because this is a quite old osteoporotic lady. I think that becomes a, a choice instead of doing anterior carpectomy. If you are supposed to do anterior carpectomy, then I would do in lateral position. And the same position, we can put the screws or posterior percutaneous pedicular screw fixation. Okay. Varun? Chaps. So, uh, so this lady, because of the neurological deficit, needs a decompression, that is for sure. In my hands, it would be more of an MIS anterior kind of an approach, an anterior corpectomy and maybe a percutaneous pedicle screw fixation at the back and uh, with a cage supporting the corpectomy in the front. Okay. Arun? Chabra, sir. Chabra, sir. Yeah, I would um, uh, go in posterior, all posterior, but I would do a corpectomy and I would um, shorten the column and probably put in a peak cage in front after a corpectomy. I would go in for a long fixation, cement augmented, most probably the DEXA is likely to be less than minus uh, three in this patient for sure. So, but ultimately it depends on the feel as you put in the screws, but most probably we'll need cement augmented screws. And I would uh, do a corpectomy. Uh, there will be definitely a dynamic instability if we do a dynamic MRI done in this patient. And this is uh, a substantially unstable uh, situation, which definitely needs a fixation and a decompression, whichever way you approach it. And Arun? of course, um, you have to start on anti-osteoporotics and on comprehensive osteoporosis management, which is very essential. Dr. Varun? Sorry, uh, Arun Varun. Yeah, so um, see, this is only an MRI picture and I would, before doing a procedure, I would definitely want to do a CT scan in this case. And if the I can avoid doing a corpectomy at this age, I would definitely look for the possibility. Though, as of now, with this picture, it looks corpectomy is imminent. But if there is a chance and the fracture does get corrected by positioning and you have a CT scan that shows there is some bone on one side, I would rather use that pedicle and bone to have a fractured vertebra screw placement and the other pedicle to put transpedicular graft or maybe a synthetic graft in that to reconstruct the anterior column and then do a posterior decompression, but all done from the back. Perfect. And uh, Dr. Shailish, what's your opinion? No, I think uh, at times I find it difficult to do a transpedicular decompression because that's a big fragment and it won't go backwards. Uh, probably I will do a facerectomy. I will do anterior uh, uh, plus posterior. Anterior reconstruction is important. Decompression also is important because uh, that has to be achieved and maybe three or four levels above and three levels below minimum. So uh, all the faculties are in consensus that the uh, surgical intervention is needed. 
so there yes. are different ways to bell a cat so depending yes. on which way you are familiar and safer yeah. so uh, i i will show you what i have done uh, next slide please and yeah. next next slide next slide please uh, uh, yeah i i went anterior and posterior anterior a corpectomy and a stud graft and a posterior no laminectomy only a pedicle screw fixation no no before that this is a different the slide previous slide yes and uh, as uh, the osteopro and the osteoporotic treatment was optimized injections uh, the everything was uh, given and she was holding on for 12 years without any subsequent fractures and uh, after 12 years she died of some other reasons okay okay nice so thing yeah as as uh, rightly said there are different ways uh, to deal uh, and luckily she is a lean and thin lady not very overweight and uh, you really did a good show, uh, good job uh, at times you can actually uh, if it is a fresh fracture you can actually get away without doing a anterior decompression but uh, that's the experience and the uh, judgment which is required in neuro deficit cases but uh, yeah. yes uh, shiva any uh, uh, thoughts on this now this is this is a different 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 case now is it no uh, i'm not presenting this case uh, i have finished my presentation on that Oh, I see. No, I, I, was, I think it's a wonderful result, and I think um, uh, is a you know people generally think of corpectomy as more invasive, but if you do a, a corpectomy and then you save the patient from a direct decompression and you are able to fuse fewer segments, it's it's a less invasive procedure, uh, and so I think it's a very elegant solution for this problem. Absolutely. perfect thank you suresh uh, we we move on to the next uh, case by dr chabra over to you sir uh, uh just a minute let me uh you are seeing my screen but not the slide are you yeah i can see uh, your screen uh, you can't see my slide right slide also we can see sir right fine fine so uh you can see the slide well now yeah perfect right so um this is a 50 this is we uh, had this 59 year old female who presented to us with weakness of right lower limb since two days and leakage of urine since one day uh, she had a history of a chronic liver disease with portal hypertension hypothyroidism and restrictive lung disease and uh, you can see that there was neurological deficit more gross on the uh, uh, right side than on the left side but also she had re reduced perianal sensation uh, so consistent with a cauda equina syndrome Uh, i'm sorry i don't have very good images but you can see that there was a, a osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture at l1 and uh, which on a dynamic view you could see instability on an mri you could see the compression and this was there was a neurological deficit along with it um, and uh, so this was a case of a osteoporotic fracture l1 with paraparesis with impending cauda equina syndrome with chronic liver disease with portal hypertension with hypothyroidism with restrictive lung disease in fact it was not impending it was a cauda equina syndrome so um um uh, shailesh what would be the challenges for managing this patient 
So I think first challenge is the medical uh, problem. That's a very mm. important, you know, we try right. to treat one thing and at the same time, we have to keep an eye on what medically, how she will sustain if we are planning to do something. Optimizing her, getting a team involved, explaining the patient and family about what we are planning to do is very important in such cases, sir. Very rightly said. So there was um, all those medical problems and the anesthetist said, no way we can put her through general anesthesia for surgery in this patient, right? So very you... you uh, just nailed it, and uh, this was a big problem. Of course, severe osteoporosis was another issue. The DEXA uh, showed a T score of minus 5.5, and uh, we worked her up also in this regard. So, uh, quickly um, uh, asking the panel, um, uh, what would be your plan of management, Arun? Sir, uh, you've already <clears throat> listed the biggest challenge is the anesthesia and then the severe osteoporosis. Even when you decompress and fix, you are going to uh, face an uphill task, but then that is the mm -hmm. uh, need of the hour. So mm -hmm. uh, the plan would be to do a, a long level fixation, but uh, it has to be done in double quick time because of the multiple medical problems. So to keep the anesthesia time short. Uh, the choice is between a, a corpectomy and a posterior decompression. Given the medical situation, I would try to not go the corpectomy way. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Siva Ganesan, any thoughts on this case? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Uh, I think uh, speed, uh, time under anesthesia is, is paramount. Um, so I, I, I would agree with a long segment fusion, direct decompression, and then off the table. Right. Anybody has any other plan of management? Fine. Um, uh, how would you reduce the risk of implant failure due to osteoporosis? Um, uh, fine. I would ask Varun. I would, uh, sir, look for uh, cement augmented screws in this case, but... Uh, like everybody said, anesthesia and time is a challenge. Right. So various strategies which can be there, bicortical purchase, as Shailesh mentioned, wide diameter screws, PMMA or biodegradable, but cement augmentation would be the procedure of choice. And of course, you could also augment with tapes and other things which are there. Uh, other than managing the fracture and the medical management, what other aspect of management would you advise? Of course, Osteoporosis is something that we have to go in for. I will just ask a quick question, Dr. Pillai. What can be the consequences of not managing the associated osteoporosis other than implant failure? Suresh is there? Yeah. If not, uh, maybe he's traveling. Dr. Bhave? So, Shailesh? Yes, sir. There is a possibility of a PJK or PJF, uh, you know, key yeah. uh, fracture mm -hmm. uh, above. That's a possibility because apart from this is uh, one important thing, I think uh, we need to yeah, so, so, I will quickly want to brief our colleagues, uh, who, young colleagues who are in the uh, webinar that um, uh, because we have to also look into biomechanical consequences, the muscle fatigue and the sarcopenia, which is associated, the kyphosis tends to uh, also put a bending moment on the vertebra above and below, increasing the chance of uh, their failure and vertebral compression fractures there. So the risk of uh, uh, another vertebral compression fracture is uh, substantially if we don't treat it and then the spine gets gradually bent over and that leads to a shortening of the chest capacity and that can lead to uh, GI and uh, respiratory symptoms, FEV1 may get reduced, the quality of life uh, gets uh, affected because there are restricted activities of daily living increased incidence of sleep disturbances, psychosocial consequences which come with it. And um, also it has been shown that the vertebral fracture increases the risk of mortality if not appropriately treated. 
uh, the relative risk of death following a clinical fracture in the uh, fracture intervention trial, you can see that there is a 8.6 fold risk of a, a death and the lifetime risk of death, death as a result of fractures is equal to that of breast cancer. So you can see here in a summary the downward spiral that can take place if you do not treat these patients of osteoporosis. I'll quickly summarize what we did. We did a kyphoplasty of L1 with percutaneous stabilization of D12 L2. And this was done with cement augmentation, but all under local anesthesia. We did not go under a GA. And uh, the patient had good results. We started with bladder management. Patient was evaluated for osteoporotic profile. Periparatide was started. Calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Dietary counseling for protein, uh, counseling for protein rich diet and fall prevention were done. So uh, uh, we can, as uh, Suresh previously also said, there are very uh, many ways to bella cat, but in um, this case, uh, because our anesthetists uh, were not uh, brave enough and they said, no way, we would allow you to give GA to this patient. So we did everything. Again. Uh, of course, under anesthesia, anesthetist care, MAC as you would put it, but we did uh, the procedure under local anesthesia and we had good results. Wonderful case and actually a nightmare uh, when you're planning for doing this case and what will happen tomorrow is always a missing beat feeling for a surgeon uh, and uh, whatever best possible option we need to think of and what you did is a great uh, learning for all of us, sir. Doing it in local anesthesia, minimum time, fixing short segment, doing a kyphoplasty, stabilizing anterior plus posterior cortex, decompressing, everything, absolutely spot on. <laughs> Any other inputs, Shiva? Uh, I think that's a great result and uh, avoiding general anesthesia, very, very smart, uh, uh, multiple benefits from that. That's wonderful. Bhavi, sir? Yeah, yeah. Under local anesthesia, that is the best thing what you can offer to the patient. Yeah. So problems of GA and everything is uh, minimized. Yeah. Yeah. Suresh? Yes. Arun? <laughs> There was a little connection problem. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't see the whole thing, but I understand it was a minimally invasive surgery yeah. for a GA contraindicated patient. Excellent, oh. sir. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Varun, any anything from you? Yeah, so it was an excellent done procedure, sir. And uh, we should, uh, you know, uh, learn, uh, take away from this is that even things out of the box thinking of a local anesthesia placing the screws can really help the patient with this. It was okay, we have been doing kyphoplasty under local anesthesia since a long time now because that is helpful in that if there is any uh, deficit the patient can or if there's any pain he can tell uh, he can he can inform you at that time. Plus uh, with a grossly osteoporotic spine putting in screws uh, is not a challenge. It goes in easily. So we were able to uh, manage in this patient this way. Uh, so, yeah, very nicely done, uh, sir. And I think there are a lot of uh, things which really can be talked about in a webinar, uh, like a vertebral body stenting, vessel plasty, what Dr. Bhave is doing, a heart shield, mm -hmm. which is also a very good implant for uh, long fixations with a uh, with a strong lamina. Uh, kyphosis correction, the adjacent segment disease, proximal junctional failure cases. There are so many things which can be discussed, but I think probably we'll have to do one more session on these uh, remaining uh, cases. Thank you, uh, all esteemed faculty and uh, our viewers for giving us a great time uh, and looking forward uh, seeing you uh, once again. Uh, thank you, Chabra, sir, uh, and the advocacy uh, committee team okay. for uh, uh, from ASSI uh, to give us the great opportunity. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, and, uh, thank you. I just want to put in one last word, um, uh, Shalish. Um, I think on this World Osteoporosis Day, we should point out, especially to our young colleagues, that still in India and in other parts of the world, more than 80% of patients who have osteoporosis and who have a manifestation which is 
which is uh, so evident that it is osteoporosis, that is a fracture, they still go untreated with osteopor osteoporosis management. So yeah. um, like hip fractures not being treated for osteoporosis, but just for the hip fracture. So there is a very high rate of uh, under diagnosis and uh, under treatment for osteoporosis. And we should all pledge that uh, we should take the earliest opportunity to start on comprehensive osteoporosis management for these patients other than just stabilization of the fracture. And uh, that, that message should go out loud. And that yes. is one of the reasons why in India, we probably should not be advocating endocrinologists to be roped in for every case. The orthopedic surgeon is capable, Absolutely. the spine surgeon is capable of managing osteoporosis and should use the first opportunity of starting the uh, treatment. And very importantly, counseling on the importance of comprehensive osteoporosis management so that the patient is compliance, uh, compliant with it. That is very important. That was just the message I wanted Perfect. to give. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this. And we are planning for the second episode in the month of December on injury prevention and, again, osteoporosis. We'll club it uh, to our webinar. We will be in touch with you all, uh, esteemed faculty and uh, Dr. Siva giving us great time from the US. Thank you once again, Ahilan and everyone, Chabra sir and all of you. Thank you very much. We catch up again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Bye, sir. Apparently. Yeah, Ashok, thank you. Ashok, are you going to take the recording first? Thank you, Shailesh. Streaming is...